a forerunner is either a sound or a, a feeling or a smell that warns you, gives you sort of a heads up, if you, if you want to use a more contemporary term, gives you a heads up that something is going to happen. I'll give you an example of a forerunner that happened in my family. My great aunt was married and living in Halifax during the, the, the Second World War. Her husband worked in a tugboat. He was out on a tugboat and she heard a knock on the door. She went downstairs to answer the door and there was on the doorstep a piece of wet seaweed. Now, she didn't see what was going to happen to her husband, but she came back upstairs and, and told whoever was there, her children, I've just experienced a forerunner. And in a day's time or so, they heard that her husband was, was drowned. Croft says these unsettling messages are prevalent, even today. I just got a call a couple of months ago from a, a colleague of mine who had what she felt was a very strong supernatural experience uh, before her aunt died of hearing loud, loud knocks uh, on first the front door. And then when she questioned that it could be the front door, she heard it on the back door. And then a couple of days later, her aunt died. So this is, this is something that, that people are still living with today. This is, this is not a, an old-fashioned thing. People are still experiencing these things. I can't explain them. I have no way of, of even trying to. I headed to Mahone Bay, Nova Scotia to see newspaper journalist Vernon Oikel. Vernon is author of a popular book of supernatural stories collected in the Maritimes. It was Vernon's very personal experience with a forerunner that inspired his interest in the subject. Back in the uh, uh, early 80s when I was studying journalism in, in Alberta, um, I saw a man um, wearing a black overcoat and a uh, big black brimmed hat, and then he wasn't there. A few days later when I was speaking with my mom, uh, she related a similar experience that my sister had uh, on the same night. We figured it was the same night and the same time, and she described the man she had seen as pretty much the same type of uh, image that I had seen. We all, particularly my mother, assumed that that was a forerunner that both my sister and I had seen. And a few days later, uh, an uncle, a great uncle that we had known for obviously all our lives, uh, passed away. And, uh, you know, so was that his forerunner? Perhaps. Lifelong woodsman Max Wicker's forerunner haunts him to this very day. Can you tell me the story of the forerunner that concerns your mother? Yeah, that's the one that I was in the woods there. Yeah. And uh, we were playing cards. But while we're playing, as I sat, uh, like Lee sat here and Robert was here and I was back here f facing the window. And then all of a sudden, it was just like a white blanket was right down over the window. And then I remarked right there and then, I said, I said, did you fall see that? What? That, that white over the window went down, just like a sheet. Oh, Lee said, that's snow on the roof. You went out and looked, it flashed, there wasn't a crumb of snow anywhere to be seen on the roof. And then I said, now there, that's a forerunner for my mother. And then the next day she died, just like that. Oh, yeah. In Newfoundland, people define these omens of death and doom differently. Folklorist and ghost expert Dale Jarvis filled me in. The most common type of story I get from Newfoundland uh, are what are referred to here as tokens. Uh, which is where someone will have some sort of uh, premonition or, or sign that someone close to them has either recently died or that their death is about to occur. Um, by far, it's the most common type of uh, story I get from Newfoundlanders. And the standard one is, uh, is about where someone uh, at a distance has died and a person will see that person uh, in front of them uh, in an impossible situation. Tour guide Joey Wheel says forerunners are definitely the most disturbing of all supernatural stories. Well, let's put it this way. Seeing a forerunner is more frightening than seeing a ghost because uh, with the forerunner, you're still not sure who's going to get it, you know? Someone you know, yourself. What kind of doom is this uh, forewarning of? If you see a funeral procession on the road and you know that you were just seeing something, there wasn't really a funeral that day, that's what's really frightening when you're wondering, all right, whose funeral is coming? And that's the nice drama of those stories. My favorite forerunner is a story about a fiddler named Johnny Matty. He was playing a, a fiddle in someone's parlor. And uh, just a great party, everyone's had a wonderful time. All of a sudden, Johnny Matty stops, right in the middle of a reel. Packs up his stuff, leaves the party. Of course, you know, the host of the party's thinking, what's going on? No fiddler, no party, it's as simple as that. So he runs after Johnny Matty, 
finally catches up to him and says, Johnny, Johnny, what, what gives? You were doing great in there. You know, everyone was having a great time. And Johnny turns around and says to him, I will never play another note in that parlor again. And he thinks, well, what happened? Was there an insult? I mean, what's wrong? No, he said no insult. But as sure as I'm standing here, while I was sitting in there playing that fiddle, I saw three coffins float inside your parlor window. And with that, he turned around and left. Well, that was, I believe, 1918, which was the year of the big flu epidemic. And within that year, before a few months had passed, three members of that household had died. And they were all waked in that very parlor Johnny Matty was playing. And because of the narrowness of the hallways, all three coffins had to be taken in and out through that parlor window, just as Johnny Matty had seen it. Joey told me the details of the island's best known forerunner. It involves the ominous happenings at the Kirk of St. James. The story begins early in the morning, October the 8th, 1853. There was a ship's captain who was on his way to work very early in the morning, about 6.30. Uh, it was a daily routine. He did this every day. He would walk from the west end of town all the way to the Charlottetown Harbor. However, on this day, something happened that didn't normally happen. He heard bells pealing. He heard church bells ringing in sets of nine. Over and over again, I kept hearing this. Nine bells in a row. He paused and he heard it again. And pretty soon he caught on. These are the bells of the kirk. He comes across the sexton of the church, who is equally puzzled as to why these bells are ringing so early in the morning. As they approach the church, they see three women dressed in white standing in front of the church. And as they approach and get closer, these women quickly go right in the door. The door closes behind them. And of course, they follow after. They go to see who these women are, and they find the doors locked. Well, the sexton has the key, right? So the sexton lets himself in, looks around. There's no one in the church. The captain, however, he's still outside, and he sees what he thinks is one of these, you know, women upstairs in the tower. So he says, you know, check in the tower. Let's go up and see if they're up there. And they go up the tower. Sure enough, they find no one there, and there's no explanation as to why they and many others reportedly heard these bells ringing that morning. However, the true significance of this sighting and of these bells became apparent when they heard what had happened the night before. A steamer called the Fairy Queen, which made regular passage with mail and passengers from Charlottetown to Pictou, had sunk just uh, about a mile from its destination in Pictou. Uh, because they didn't have enough lifeboats on board, nine people drowned that night. Three of them were women, and all three of those women were members of the congregation of the Kirk of St. James.